Okay guys, just to get back into the swing of things, in this video we're going to model, unwrap, and texture this toaster. Again, we're not going to do everything in the picture. We want to keep this a pretty quick video and keep it pretty simple, so we'll probably simplify the majority of this. But let's get started. So again, this image is just on my desktop. I'm just going to send this to the front view. Again, I can also go up here and go to front, drag and drop this toaster. And again, I'm not going to be working off this exclusively. I just want to have it in the viewport so I have something to reference. And again, having something to kind of go off of is a very, very common thing. Um, the last thing I want to do is just start in a blank scene with a box and have nothing to look at and just say, okay, what does a toaster look like inside of my head? Having something up is going to be quite a big help. The first thing I'm going to want to do is drop in a box. Again, I have an empty scene aside from my backdrop item and it has this empty mesh in it. So I want to put the cube inside of this mesh so to drop a one meter by one meter by one meter cube, I can hold the control key and just click on the box up here, and then I get that guy right here. Go ahead and turn on wireframe and get started with this. So again, initially he's going to be a little bit too big. Ideally one meter for a toaster is going to be a little bit too large. I'm just going to go to view, turn on this dimension tool, and this is going to show me how big everything is. So again, we got one meter, one meter, one meter. Let's go ahead and scale that down a little bit somewhere in there and again we don't need to be perfect with the size I just want to get it a little bit more realistic and then we'll make our concept art roughly the same size as well and again if you want to try to grab this backdrop item if you're in item mode up here you can just grab that and move it around if you're in something like polygon mode this isn't a three-dimensional object that's polygons and verts and whatnot so you won't be able to grab it so with this being this size I'm going to go ahead and turn off this dimension tool and then get started modeling this guy. So looking at the shape we have these round edges right here so we're gonna go ahead and do those first so with that I'm just gonna grab this edge and this edge and again if I go to the front view this is gonna be the front of my toaster I wanna have it facing kinda like it is in this image so again this is gonna be the top up here so I'm gonna grab this side and this side grab those edges and I'll be beveling those. So let's just get those generic shapes in somewhere around there and I'm going to increase this roundness level up one and this is going to be the starting point. So already I don't want to start beveling more things. Let's get our basic shape down of this guy. So let's go ahead and grab the width of it. Grab the bottom. Pull it up. And if we have the grid on, just go to the front view. It's usually best to have whatever your object is sitting on this floor plane right here. And we'll go ahead and move this up as well. So you'll notice I didn't actually scale it up and down like this to make it taller. I actually grabbed the bottom and moved it up and down. And the reasoning behind that was I already made these beveled edges up here and I liked how this curvature was so if I was to stretch these again that bevel itself is going to stretch as well to where this polygon here and this polygon here these dimensions here and here aren't going to be the same so if I just simply grab the bottom and move it up and down it's changing the height of the box without changing the overall form of this curve so the next thing I'm going to do is grab these edges because what I want to do is kind of get the roundness that goes from here to here. I'm not actually going to have that inset. We'll keep it simple. And then I'll deselect those edges. So the idea here is to get a bevel similar to this. We'll take its roundness down. Is get a bevel kind of like this. But just going through that process again, I want to select these edges as fast as possible and again if you see if I select it like this or if I just sit here and I click every single one this has taken a lot longer than it should be so kind of the fastest way to select all these is to just go to a side view like this middle mouse click and grab all of those edges right there hold shift middle mouse click grab all the edges right there and then hold the control key left click and just kind of paint over this edge and it'll remove that edge so again Whenever you're modeling something, you want to think of what's the fastest way 
that I can grab the series of edges, polygons, verts, whatever I'm grabbing to get kind of my end result the fastest. Because again, you don't want to spend all day selecting individual vertices one at a time. You just want to get them done kind of as fast as possible. So again, we'll go ahead and do B to bevel. And then as soon as this edge bevel you see is activated, I right click in the 3D viewport. My little tool comes up. I can left click that, drag it out, and that bevel starts happening. So we want to make this around right there. So hit spacebar, that drops the tool, kind of finalizes that bevel. Or again, you can hit the escape key, and then I can either hit spacebar again to kind of drop the selection, or I can just left click, right click, and lasso select, whatever, just to deselect those edges. So this is looking pretty good. Next thing I want to do is get these little two holes for where the toast is going to go in. So ideally what I want to do is I'm going to want to have a cut right here and a cut right here. So I don't want to have too many cuts that are kind of looping around this way. I could do something like this, start getting a bunch of cuts going this way, and then do the same thing over here, get a handful of cuts going this way, and then select the desired ones that I want. But I don't want to have that many cuts in my overall object right now because I want to keep this kind of low poly. Again, um, we're going to kind of do a simplified version of this I mentioned before. So what I'm going to do is select one or two of these edges. doesn't really matter as long as at least two are selected. And do the loop slice tool. So again, if we go over to Mesh Edit, the loop slice is right there. Um, I have a hotkey set up for Alt-C. So the loop slice tool is activated. Its count is currently set to three. I actually don't need the count that high, so let's take the count down to one, and we'll call this good. So let's hit the space bar, and let's look underneath. So right now, our overall loop went up and around and back down, and it stopped right here. And the reason why it stopped is because this right here is an end gun. You've just seen the same thing. When I did a loop slice this way, it stopped at this because this is again an end gun. So if I hide this, we have all these vertices. And then just one face that kind of goes along with those vertices. So if we wanted this to connect here to here, we'd have to make this kind of not be an end gun anymore. So let's undo this slice, and let's cut this up to where it doesn't have the end gons here, here, and here anymore. And again, if you're not sure where to find end gons, just more review. If I open up this tab, the lists tab, go over here, open up polygons. We want to select those by vertex greater than four, which is right here. So we hit this little plus, and that selects the side, the back, and the bottom. So these are the known, in a sense, end guns we need to clear up. So I'm just going to use the edge slice tool and just intelligently connect these edges. So I'm going to go from here to here, hold shift to kind of restart the tool, click here, make sure it says 100% to 0%, hold shift, click, click, hold shift to start a new one. And then this one, make sure it says 0%. And we'll just remove that guy. And the reason it needs to kind of say 0 and 100%, so if I click here and then click down here, where it just says 0.5%, if I zoom way in on this, technically we have a vertice here and a vertice here. So ideally that's when you're modeling really, really bad, because again, this used to be a quad, and now it's an end gun. So when we tried to clear up the creation of one end gun, we actually created, in a sense, if they were both quads, two more end guns trying to clear it up. So you can kind of do more harm than good if you're not paying attention. So if you don't like the slice tool, what you can do is I'll just grab this polygon and delete it. And now I'm going to grab these edges. So one, two, three, four, five. Grab the same as over here. One, two, three, four, five. And I'm just going to bridge these two together. So I have a hotkey set up for that, but if you don't, 
you go over here to edge, you have the bridge command right here. So the bridge command is active, segment set to one, twist to zero. We right click and it kind of does all that work for us. So let's do the same thing down here, but we'll kind of split it up, use edge slice on this side and use the bridging technique on this side. So again, I want my edges to connect from here to here. So edge slice, 0%, go over here, 100%, oh, it says 97, just move that over, it says 100, hold shift, click, 0, 100. So other way real quick, go ahead and delete that edge, we'll grab this guy, this guy, and this guy, and the same thing on this edge, we're pretty much grabbing this entire boundary and excluding these two edges, so that kind of be the fast way of selecting it. So just double click this open hole, hold control, and deselect those. So we fire up that bridge command, right click, and everything's all set. So now let's just double check. Greater than four polygons is zero. So we're good, there's no more end guns. So let's go ahead and do that edge slice again that we had. Now you can see it goes all the way around because now it's slicing through a bunch of quads. So now what we want to do is technically, if we were to kind of make these the slots for our toast, they would be way too wide. This toast would tip over and probably catch on fire. So what we want to do is make a smaller hole in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take advantage polygon tab of this little guy called inset. So if I just click one of these, left click, right click, you can see what it does is it just kind of does a similar thing to the bevel tool. So if I grab this edge, be to bevel, right click, scale that in, you can see it's kind of doing the same thing. But how inset differs is if I grab both of these edges, be to bevel, right click, and I go to move this, what it's doing is it's beveling these two polygons as a whole, as opposed to inset, right, left click, right click, now it's beveling these guys kind of individually, it's treating them as individuals as opposed to the same thing. So now let's take a look at this overall shape. If these were going to be the holes for the toast, we actually want to make these a little bit wider. Let's just grab them both, hit R to scale, pull those back a little bit, and we'll call that good. So now we can grab both of these. Again, left click, hold shift, left click. We have both tops. I'm just going to do an extrude. Go to Mesh Edit, the little tool for it's right there. Extrude Tools Active, right click. Grab our Y axis and pull that down and let's kind of look in there. Just get that a little bit lower. Let's look at it actually from the front view. So somewhere in there. So again, if I grab this side, look at the side that roughly would be how big our toast is, which again, is going to be fine if we don't really like the width, if we want it to be wider or whatnot, we can always let's just go to the front view, lasso select this, kind of scale it out a little bit. Now we have a little bit wider of a toast, but again, be mindful that you're changing the shape of this bevel. So I can pull that one out, grab this one, pull that one out a little bit. Now let's look at this from the front. There we go. Now I'll just make it a little bit deeper. I know the bottom of it's right here, so I'm just going to switch to vertice mode, middle mouse click so it selects through. We'll just pull those down a little bit. So again, I'm not going to worry about the actual coils in here, the little collection tray for crumbs on the bottom, but we will throw the handle in real quick. And that, it looks like there's an adjuster now. We're not going to worry about that. We'll just make a little mock handle. And again, we'll actually go off the concept for this. So let's make a box, and of course it comes in huge, we'll just go ahead and scale that right down. Move this over here, scale in, scale down, and we'll just bevel these edges right here. And again, one thing to note about bevels is I beveled this just a little bit, so let's have a quick comparison real quick. Oops. 
make sure I don't screw anything up. There we go. So the original one, the one that we're going to keep is beveled like this guy right here. So let's look at that, the bevel settings. So if we look over here, the roundness level is just set to one. Actually, let's make that a little bit farther pulled out, about right there. So what I don't want to do is grab these two edges and have this roundness level set to something crazy high like four. Because now if I just hide this guy, if I look at this and just compare it, how many edges we have right here is really, really disproportionate to how many edges we had for this bevel or how many edges we had for this bevel. And you want to kind of keep scale in mind when you're doing this. So if I only use a roundness level of two for this bevel right here, I probably don't want to use a roundness level for four for this bevel because there's no reason that this tiny object would be way rounder than this object. Again, we're going for something kind of low poly. So again, the curvature right here, I use a roundness level of one. This one right here, I use a roundness level of one. Technically, I could probably even get away with deleting those out, having this roundness level so the bevel would be have a roundness level of zero in a sense. And the purpose behind that is as soon as I zoom out, turn the wireframe off, we want to make sure that it kind of just reads cohesively and we don't have a crazy high poly count. So right now we're at 224 tries. So the next stage I want to do before I unwrap is kind of the cleanup stage. So let's go ahead and grab this little shape. We see there's an end gun here and here. Let's go ahead and take care of that. Slice that up. And then looking at this, I'm going to kind of see if I can't reduce any areas. And there's really only a couple that I see that really need it. So at this point, um, having quads everywhere isn't super important. So what I'm going to do is start joining some edges. So here and here, having this long skinny polygon, this really isn't doing much for the profile or the shape of our object. So I'm just going to grab this and do a join average of those vertices. Do the same thing on this side. Actually, let's, before we keep doing that, let's look at our poly count. We're at 224. And just to remember that, let's name the mesh 224. So now let's go in and start getting rid of these. So join average, same process over here. Now realistically this whole edge right here all the way around isn't doing anything, especially all these shapes down here. It's just a flat surface. So I'm going to go ahead and just double click and get rid of this. So I can just backspace. So this vertice right here is still held because these guys right here, this is a kind of cutout shape. It needs to hold somewhere. So what I'm going to do, edge slice, left click, left click. Now I can get rid of these, backspace. Other thing I can do, control and one, toggle verts. Now my vertices are going to show up as little black dots. So I can make sure those are getting eliminated. So edge slice here to here, get rid of those. So again, we're at 166, backspace, now 164. Just got rid of two more. And looking around, we'll see if there's any other super obvious spots. It's not really looking like it. So we'll call this good. So unhiding our handle right here, we just want to look at this guy. We can look inside. There's this polygon right here that's never going to be seen. So let's move him to where he's just sticking in there. Hit delete. We got rid of two more tries. So we're going to call this good for the model. We don't have really any wasted tries. It's all looking pretty good. We were at 224. Now we're at 182. So difference of about 40, almost exactly. So again, we just saved 40 tries. And again, as soon as we turn the wireframe and the verts off, the model itself would look exactly the same. So the next thing we want to do is look at the smoothing on this object. So I'm okay with where this is at smoothing wise, but let's go ahead and throw a material on this. We haven't done that yet, so let's just select all the polygons. There's really nothing else in the scene, but can I just do that out of habit? So M for material, 
name this toaster, hit OK. So now we have the material down here. Material reference right here, smoothing angle, set this to 89. And what that's going to do is it was at 40, so this was less than a 40 degree, or greater than a 40 degree angle, so it didn't smooth across there. So as soon as you change that to 89, that smooths across. But this face to this face is a 90 degree angle, so it's keeping a hard edge there. Same thing with the bottom. And now the roundness level here is going around here, because again, this guy is greater than a 90 degree angle, so it's just going to smooth all the way across. So if we look at it from afar, it just looks like a smooth surface all the way across. So again, this is what we're going to call good for our smoothing, and now we can get to unwrapping. So let's start unwrapping this guy. Go over to the UV Edit tab. So these are kind of the UVs that got changed as I was modeling on it. So let's just move these out of the way. Move that over a little bit. Let's go ahead and grab the bottom, the unwrap tool, and looking at our settings here, we have this guy set to angle base, 20%, planar. We'll just change that to UNX just to start off. So it's kind of just resetting stuff to defaults. So this should probably be pretty good right here. So let's move that out of the way and kind of start over with this. So I'm going to grab all the polygons on the bottom, left click to activate the unwrap tool, hover over the 3D viewport, right click, and it unwraps this portion. So this portion is kind of good, so I can scale that down, move it out of the way, and what I'm going to do is say this stuff up here is unfinished, this stuff is finished, this is going to be my working area, because again whenever you select something and unwrap it, it's going to click and try to fill this one-to-one -one space. Next thing I'm going to do is throw a checker pattern on here real quick. So again, just from my desktop, we have our toaster material. Just grab this checker pattern, drag it, and drop it. And now we have one. Again, if you don't have one, um, I've put this up a bunch of times, but again, you can just find any old checker pattern online. And now I can see that this is kind of unwrapped okay, it's just not oriented correctly. So we can kind of go to the next piece. Let's get this handle out of the way real quick. We can probably get this all in one piece. So it's open right here. So again, ideally I want to have this island together, this island together, and this section. So if I wanted to, I could just grab these faces, left click, right click, grab these faces, left click, right click, and again pay attention where my cursor is at, it's just literally left clicking unwrap tool, hover over the 3D viewport, right click, just like any other tool. So now we have kind of three separate islands for each one of these, but ideally what I could do is have this all one piece and I could just have it shared with this edge right here. So let's do this again. All those should come unwrapped already. So left click, you must select these and these, these, and these. So again, it's going to have this shape right here. So this one right here is going to be connected to this top piece at this edge and this edge. That's why those aren't selected. Again, unwrapping seems kind of complicated, but grab a simple shape like this and just practice with it for 20 minutes and you'll really quickly get the hang of it. Usually people who have problems with unwrapping just don't feel like putting in the time to actually trying out the tool. They just try something super complicated like a character, they can't unwrap it, they get frustrated. Just start with a simple shape like this and it just saves you a bunch of time down the road. So left click, right click, and again now we have this piece all in one piece. So again, one little UV island, move it down to the kind of correct area. So if you're confused on what you have and haven't unwrapped, since I have it split into three different sections, let's just move that up a little bit. I can just instantly look down here, okay that stuff's unwrapped, anything in the bottom section, so just hide that. Now the only stuff that I'm looking at over here is the stuff that hasn't been unwrapped yet. So let's go ahead and do the inside of these guys. So let's just select this a little bit easier and we'll do these both at the same time. So 
click, hold shift, click, so we have the bottoms of both of these. If I hold shift and the up arrow, it's going to grow that selection. So now we have the insides of both of these. And these I want to have separate from the outside of the toaster because again, it's an inset that we don't want to try to have unwrapped with the outside of the toaster. It's just a separate piece of it. So from here, if I try to just unwrap the shape with nothing on it, it's not going to really understand what's going on. And from this, just to back up myself, because I don't want anything to crash and lose all the work, I'm going to hold Control shift s for save. Name this toaster. And now I have that save. So one more thing, and again I'll mention this in class, but preferences, autosave. Auto saves enabled, it saves every five minutes. I have it saved to my desktop, and I have a folder called Moto Backup, Moto 901. I have a version for each version of Moto I have on my computer. If you don't like where it's currently located on your computer, make a folder somewhere, select that folder. So desktop, Moto Backup, Moto 902. These are all my backup files. Hit choose, and that'll be the location. Number of revisions, 20. So I'll have after X amount of minutes, I'll have 20 different versions of this toaster saved out, and then the oldest one will get saved over. Highly recommend having this autosave set to 5 or 10 minutes. You should do this probably before you even start working on any project. And again, once you save that the first time, it should stay true thereafter because it's just a setting that gets saved. So looking back at this unwrap, what we want to do is kind of make this potentially one piece. So let's for simplicity's sake, let's just look at one at a time. So if I treat this kind of like a box, and just grab these inside edges, hit unwrap, I get this huge plus shape that I really don't like. So I don't mind this, but it's these guys coming out that's just going to make this kind of an unbearable shape. So I want to split these guys off. So let's undo that to where I have both of them. Let's just do this to both of these. Grab these edges, grab these edges. Unwrap right click. So again, now I have two big shapes that it'd be hard to kind of pack these together even if they were packed close. I still have this wing coming out here and this wing coming out here that I really don't like. So how I'm gonna address this is pretty simple. I'm just gonna grab this and this edge, hit W to move. Now over here, I'm going to hit this little checkbox called Tear Off. Now when I move this, it's just going to break it right off. And I can just move these wherever, get them out of the way. Now I have this tight, packed, ready to go. And if I wanted to, I could even grab these two and pull them off. It doesn't really matter. So let's grab this, unhide everything move this down here and shrink it down. And again, I'm not actually packing the UVs down here. I'm just shrinking stuff down so it's small and out of the way. So I have more room for the other pieces. So the inside of the toaster is all set. Let's go ahead and hide this. So what we're probably going to do is break off the front of the toaster and the back of the toaster and have this wraparound piece probably all be one piece. So let's turn this texture off so it's easier to see. I'm going to grab these faces, hold shift, up arrow, and say that this right here is kind of the front that I'm working with. Actually, hold shift and the up arrow one more time. We'll say that this is the area I'm working with. Left click, right click. It unwraps like so. Works perfect. But we want to do those kind of at the same time. So let's grab these ones, hold shift, click, grab those ones, shift, up arrow twice, doing these both at the same time, left click, right click, now I have both sides of the toaster right here. And again, if you're familiar with mirroring UVs, I could mirror these over, but for this demonstration, we're not going to worry about that. Again, we want to make this video fairly quick. So that being said, this is the last piece. We're not even going to select any edges, just to unwrap on it. See what it does. It curves around in this manner on these three. And then, well, this would be kind of flipped that way. How we're looking at it here. But regardless, this goes up. 
then there's those pieces, and then it comes back down that way. So again, there's no complicated stuff, it's just a curve, so it handles it really well, kind of like a cylinder. So unwrap is done. Now we're into the packing stage of this. We'll want to turn this checker pattern back on. So let's see what happens when we hit pack UVs, pack stretch orient, everything set to auto, hit OK. We'll just see what happens. So lo and behold, it does a terrible job. So we can definitely do a better job than this. So let's turn on this UDIM indicator and hit show coverage. So right now we're sitting at 50.9%. So just so we don't have to remember that. 50.9 is where we were at. So almost 50% of this texture would just be wasted space. It, it's a terrible unwrap in all honesty. So the good thing that it did though was it made the scale of everything correct. So the checker pattern size over here is the same as over here. Whereas before, if I go back enough, you can see this one was huge. So we had little checker patterns on here and these ones are really big. So it at least makes everything uniform. So even though it did give us a terrible unwrap, it did start us off kind of better than we were. So I'm gonna go ahead and not really worry about my 3D viewport. I already know everything lines up and looks okay. So let's just start getting this stuff out of the way. So we wanna take care of our biggest piece first. So this piece right here is gonna be definitely our biggest one. And biggest, not because it has the most volume, but because it has the most distance from one point to another. So what I'm gonna do is, let's see if I can't orient this piece vertical, hit OK, now it snaps up and down. So I want this piece to take up as much space as it possibly can. So I'm gonna scale it up, but I don't wanna scale just this piece up because again, that's gonna screw up, oops, our checker sizes and not make them the same size. So we'll undo that. We're gonna grab everything, scale it up into where it just barely fits in here. So we'll scale it down a little bit. Then we want to have a little bit of padding from edge to edge. Go ahead and look at this one. So somewhere in there is going to be just fine. So now we have these pieces, and I don't honestly know if all of these pieces, and grab that, are going to fit in this remaining piece, but we'll go ahead and try it. So this guy, let's see if we can't orient him vertically. Oh, it kind of did it. Again, it's kind of a trapezoid-esque shape. So I want to have this long straight be as straight as possible. So I kind of just eyeballed it and got pretty lucky there. Do the same for this one. So somewhere in there. Now we have this shape. And again, this is kind of sad. It doesn't really fit in there. So let's try rotating it. Oops, this way. And again, I'm going to hold control right click so it snaps for me. So it fits in that way pretty good. So let's see if this one will fit in right here. And it does. I'm not sure about the other pieces. I might have to kind of go to the drawing board with this. And that happens every once in a while when you're unwrapping stuff. And again, I want to be mindful. It looks fine all right here. But if I go in right here, those two edges are way too close to each other. So what I'm going to do is I see there's a big gap here and here. So let's go ahead and move those back. The other thing, if I go ahead and move this over here, the overlap's going to show up in red. Options, fill polygons, now they're filled with white, so this might make it a little bit easier for you as well. It just depends on what settings you want. So we have this piece, which is the bottom. The bottom isn't really going to be seen, so this is going to be one where I kind of break the rule and I'm going to scale this piece down. And then we have this piece in this piece, which these, let's see if they fit in better sideways, which they do. So him and him can go there and there, this little piece. Can go right here, actually, let's turn him sideways. So now this guy, he just doesn't fit. You can see there's overlap kind of everywhere. 
So I could look at this and say, okay, that's up about as high as I want it to go. And the reasoning behind that is I just want to have at least a square or a half a square of distance between here and the edge. So grab this, move it up and over as far as we can. And again, it still just doesn't fit. So again, looking at this toaster, we're not really going to see the bottom. So we're just going to take this and scale it down 6%. <laughs> so not that big of a scale at all. And now this fits in here pretty nice. And again, if we need to scale it down a little bit more, we can, but we'll leave it how it is. And this little guy, he is an independent piece. So he's not really associated with this. This is going to be like a blue chrome. This is going to be like a black plastic. So this is kind of a separate piece. So I can actually scale that up without any detriment. Because again, the bottom, I can break the rule of not having everything be the exact same size because that's not really going to be seen. And then this part right here is a separate individual piece of me scaling that up. Isn't that big of a deal? So again, we scaled one piece up, we scaled one piece down. It kind of evens itself out overall. Now actually let's just orient these pieces horizontally just so they snap and are a little bit more clean. So we'll call this good. So again, we were, oops, I ended too many times. We were, we were at 50.9% for our coverage. UDIM indicators show coverage. Now we're at 83.0. So again, we just achieved an extra 32.1. So as to say 30% more effective texture space. So again, just looking at that, if we were to break this guy into thirds, so one third right here, two thirds, three-thirds, all of this that would have been wasted is now used pixels. So again, if I zoom in on this, we have tons of little pixels that all are getting used for a texture now as opposed to just empty space where nothing would really happen. So again, model-wise, if you wanted to add this little slot right here for the toaster to go up and down, if you wanted to add it in the model, you can go ahead and do that if you wanted to. If you wanted to add a cord, you can go ahead and do that. But again, we're just going to leave this simple as if this was, say, a really like low poly game. This guy's sitting on the fridge. So you could think the new Super Mario Odyssey game. If there was a kitchen scene, a toaster with roughly this poly count would fit in the world perfect. So now that that is done, we're going to go ahead and texture this. And we're going to texture this in a really quick way. So again, um, what we're going to do is we're going to do kind of a light bake on this. AO bake, mix that with a texture. We've done this in the intro class once, and the other classes a handful of times. It just depends. But again, this should all be a review at this point. Let's go ahead and delete out this checker pattern. We're not going to need it anymore. And then from this Clips tab, we'll go ahead and delete it from here as well. So at this point, let's just go ahead and name this Toaster, save our file. And we can actually get rid of this background or backdrop item as well. There we go. So from here, I'm going to do the AO bake real quick. So on the shading tree, if I go to the render globe right here, down here it has our baking width and height. We're just gonna do this at a 512 by 512. Actually, let's do 256 by 256. This is a tiny asset that would be in a kitchen, so this is actually probably would have its texture shared with a refrigerator and a sink and a garbage disposal, whatever else you have in a kitchen. So we're just gonna use a really, really tiny texture with this. Up here, these are our kind of baking outputs. Again, the alpha is going to be a black and white, where white equals geometry, black equals kind of the background space. Final color is just going to be what are all the textures, materials, objects in the scene together, kind of your normal render, you'd say. So let's go ahead and duplicate. We can either add a new one or duplicate it. I just duplicate it because it's easier. So now we have two final colors. The second one, we're going to right click and change that to ambient occlusion. That one is under lighting right here. So again, effect, right click, lighting, ambient occlusion, click on that. So now we get a whole new thing of settings. Again, 
In most cases, if you make the rays higher, the render becomes less grainy. So let's increase those rays. Something over 200 would be fine. Again, you can kind of guess and check on that one. But 64 would probably be on the low side. So let's go ahead and bake this out. So when we're baking something, we have a few things to check. So the toaster is visible, the little eyeballs turned on. And then with the toaster selected, we go to lists, UV maps, the texture is selected. It's got the little black bar on it, so that's good. The other way to check if your UVs are selected is just go to the UV tab. Are they over there? Yes, then you're good to go. So back to the shading tree. These are the things that are going to be rendered out. Right now we don't really need alpha or final color. We just need this ambient occlusion. So everything should be checked. So let's go to render and hit bake to render outputs. Let this do its thing. So this little guy right here says ambient occlusion. So we go ahead. This guy, we just want to check this color space real quick linear and again this is something that these the image that you see here might not be the image that's getting saved out so if I click on that it gets a little bit darker with AO it doesn't really matter but for other stuff I get people complaining oh my render is too light or my render is too dark so as long as you have this LUT right here have this guy set to the same thing kind of here and here so this one's set to linear this one's set to linear Save that out. If you didn't like that, change it to sRGB. Save that out. One of those two should be good for you. But again, you don't want one to say linear and the other to say sRGB. Just make sure that they say the same thing. Go ahead and save image. And we'll just name this AO underscore toaster. Save it as a PNG on the desktop's fine. Hit save. That's done. Now we're going to do a quick light bake. So let's change this ambient occlusion. We, that one's out and done. So right click. And actually let's do right click right here. I'm just gonna change this up a little from other ways that I've done it. Um, is normally, instead of final color, do a lighting, I'll do illumination total. But a different way of doing it is just leaving it set to final color. Our material itself is a gray. So when I bake this out, it's gonna have the lighting in the scene but it's everything's going to be gray because there's no texture to applied so technically this final color output is going to look roughly as good you don't have as many settings but it's going to bake faster so it bakes faster and it's kind of less complicated so final color we'll go ahead and turn that on now i want to set up my lighting so go over here to my perspective view go down to lights do directional light and i want to have kind of one from this view. So again, the little toaster handle is going to be on the right side. Go to my light over here, go to its properties, spread angle. Let's set this to something like 50. Now let's go ahead and duplicate this. So now I have two of the same light pointing in the same direction, both spread angles set to 50. So again, if I go in this change to this light too, it clicks over and you can see it's the same viewport. So now I can spin around. So now I'm just kind of getting both sides of this. And if I wanted to, just so this side right here isn't too dark, let's go ahead and get kind of a side or a top three quarter view. So I get this side and this side. Directional light, go over here and I'll get these opposite sides. So this side and this side that are unselected. And we'll call this good for a light bake. So let's go ahead hit render, bake to render outputs, and there's one more setting I want to change. And that's, if you see down here, let's go ahead and zoom in on this a little bit. See there's a little bit of grain going on here, so we need to increase the rays of our lights. So to do that, you can go over to the shading tree, go to the render tab, and go to settings here, and now we have light samples. Increase that make it 256, do that same render. So render, baked render outputs, let it do its thing. Zoom back into that 800%. So now it's a little bit grainy, but not nearly as grainy, but we'll call it good. So LB underscore toaster. Let's jump into Photoshop real quick. 
So we have two textures. This guy we can just close. So this guy is going to be our AO. And again, the files are named up here. This one's going to be the light bake. So again, this is that sometimes complicated process of I want to separate out the whites and the blacks. So the AO, I want to take just the black information from this texture. Again, I've done this a bunch of times in class. There's a bunch of videos for it, so I'll just do it really quick. So control, click the thumbnail, grabs the whole image. Control C to copy. Channels, new channel, we only want one. Control V to paste. Now if I hold command, click the thumbnail, it's going to grab the white. Remember we said we wanted the black, so let's command I to invert. Now command, click the thumbnail, we select just the black. New layer, turn this layer off. Over here we can just reset this to black and white. Oops. I want to fill this selection now with black so I can hold Alt because that's my primary color. Alt backspace will fill that up. So now you can see I get a multitude of colors of black. So from here I can go ahead and this is layer zero. I'll just go ahead and delete him out. We'll just name this AO. Now the other thing I want to do is this image itself saved out as a black and white image. So image mode, I just want to change this to RGB color. There we go. Let's do a similar thing to this one. This is going to be kind of our light bake. So I want to grab, let's grab the white first. So command, click the thumbnail, channels, new, paste, hold command, D to deselect, hold command, click. Now I have all the white selected. So go over here, layers, turn this one off, new layer. Hold the command key and then hit backspace. That'll fill it with white. So now my white area now has white on it. Jump back over to the channels. Hold command invert. Now we're just going to do the same thing. Grab the black. Again, I apologize for you guys that have seen this a million times. So now we have LB for light bake dark and LB for light bake light. I'm just going to grab both of these and move them over to the other file. So switch to the move tool, click and drag, hold shift, and they just get thrown on top. So it's all the way on the bottom. Let's make a base color for this and our toaster is going to be kind of a bluish, tealish color. Somewhere in there and we can adjust this if we don't like it later. Let's fill that. So something like this. So let's kind of turn these on one at a time. But actually, before we do that, let's get a wireframe going so we can see what parts of the toaster are what. It's not super complicated, but for you guys that don't remember, oops, I'll undo that a few times. I don't want to move the lights. So I'll go back into the perspective view. Sorry about that. So texture, export UV to EPS, toaster UV. Save. And let's go ahead and grab that guy. We want to make it 256 by 256 pixels, RGB color. Throw that back up. So we'll name this UV Unwrap. Let's move this over here. And we'll just throw that on the top so now we can see our UVs. Again, we really want to make sure to remember to turn that off before we save this. Because again, that's something I see all the time and I hate mark marking people down for it. But again, if you were to deliver a game asset and your wireframe was turned on for some reason, that just wouldn't fly and that asset would get rejected. So let's go ahead and turn the light bake dark on. This guy we're going to set to a soft light. It's going to change everything to a darker blue. Turn on the light, change this guy to an overlay, and then it's going to be really hot. The light, the light part of the light bake is always really hot, so we like to take the opacity of that down quite a bit. 
and then the AO will turn that on and that guy we set to a soft white as well. So again, this is gonna be kind of our starting point for our textures. And remember our handle is right here. So base blue, handles right here. So something like that. And we'll just fill this in with a gray color. If we wanted to make the bottom of the toaster gray, we definitely could as well, but we'll call this good. So let's save this out and see how it looks. So we'll save the PSD toaster diff for diffuse. And then we'll save one more as a PNG. And we'll actually apply the PNG to the Modo file. So we have that right here. So let's go ahead, drag and drop that inside. So let's turn the wireframe off and take a look at this. So what we got was a little bit of a mistake, but it'll be really easy to fix. So if we look right here, Let's look at just the handle. This looks fine. Dark on the bottom, a little bit lighter on the top. This outside here is a little bit lighter. I could definitely go in and paint that, snazz it up a bit. If this right here um, wasn't modeled, I could go in at this point and paint this. But the one thing I want to point out is there's a little bit of a dark line that goes across this seam. And let's look at why this is happening. So grabbing this edge, you can see right here, Let's actually close this and actually go to the UV tab. You can see there's kind of some blue pixels bleeding into our light colored pixels, some dark blue bleeding into our light blue. And the reason behind this is just I didn't allow for enough padding when I did the bake, which is totally okay. Um, if the texture itself would have been bigger, so if I would have done a 512, that would have been fine. So again, if I look over here, right here it has one, two, three pixels between these two. So there's a little bit of bleeding of the dark into the light. So what we can do to kind of counteract this, so you see if I grab over here and look over here, let's look at just one polygon at a time. If I grab this and just move it down a little bit, you see those pictures, pixels kind of disappear. So what I'm gonna do is just grab this island and scale it down, and then grab this one, scale it down. Same thing with these ones. So let's just go ahead and grab these three islands and go to scale them down. But if I scale them down like this, they're all going to shrink into each other, which I don't want. So I'm going to do is change my action center to local. So now each piece is going to scale by itself in a little bit. So you can see if I do it in extreme fashion, they're all going to kind of scale in. But if you look, switch to vertice mode. If you look over here, you'll see these little seams kind of disappearing as I do this. So scale it about that far. So it fixed some things and kind of broke some other things. So the first thing would be over here is those guys got a little bit mixed up. So these we can just adjust by hand. It's not a big deal at all. Grab these edges, pull them up a little bit, grab these edges, pull them down, this one, pull it out, this one, pull it out. So again, not a big deal. Other thing that it screwed up would be the position of this handle, which I could grab this polygon and manipulate it any way I see fit. Same thing with up here, but kind of the easy thing to do here would be to just grab this and move it down. And the other thing is if you don't like how much darkness is happening around the outside of this. You can either grab the smudge brush in Photoshop and kind of smudge this down, and then this one would be over, up, whatever. Or we can just grab this little guy and scale it up a little bit. Turn our wireframe off, go from default to texture, so we just see the solid textures that are happening with this. So again, the inside of this is gonna be a little bit darker top's going to be a little bit lighter, and then the bottom 
ideally would be a little bit darker, but again, it's not super dark because I changed the opacity of those guys. So from here, if we wanted to, we could actually jump into the paint tab. Change this to texture. Change to airbrush. And over here we're getting this UDIM indicator, so let's go ahead, jump over here, turn that off so it's not kind of in our way. Go back to the paint tab, now we have our airbrush settings. So again, not too confusing. So if I try to paint on this, it works out just fine. Again, make sure your texture is selected. Make sure the clip over here is selected. And then in the shader tree here, you have your texture here selected. So it has a little brush here. That means you can paint on it. So now from here, we can do some stuff to kind of spruce this up a little bit. So we can put a little highlight right here on the edge. Same thing over here. And just really subtly do this if we want. We can even drop the opacity here something like 15, and I could turn symmetry on as well. I'm just painting some subtle highlights on this. Not anything too crazy, but again, something better to start with. The other thing that you could do if you wanted to would be the inside of this. So let's just select that a faster way. These sections here, you could fill that with the same black color so the inside of the toaster appears to be like black, like it'd be metal. You could have the bottom be a little bit darker as well, because ideally it wouldn't just be metal sitting on the ground. But regardless, this is just a really simple asset to get you back into Moto real quick. So we modeled it, unwrapped it, textured it, and then painted a little bit inside Moto. If I wanted to save the changes to this paint, Clips tab, right click, save. Again, if I tried to close Moto, it would say, hey, you just painted on this layer. Do you want to save it before you close? Yes, no. But again, if I bring it up now, you can see my highlights here are painted on there, painted on there as well. So again, just really quick asset for you guys, showing you the whole process. And again, polygon count wise, we don't really have a lot of if any wasted tries and texture sizes are probably pretty accommodating for the size of this object. Only mistake that we made was we probably didn't have enough padding between assets. And then again, my opacities could have been a little bit better when I was making, um, putting those layers in, but again, not a big deal at all. So again, have fun with this, try to finish it up. If you want, give it some legs, paint this little area or model it in initially, but again, something like this as a minimum would be fine to turn in.